we live in a fiat world and we live in a dollar denominated fiat world more specifically. And I was raised knowing that your environment could change in a matter of months and it could change dramatically and quite violently. And more importantly, no one really expects it to change. And what it changes into is unrecognizable to what it was before. So this idea that maybe we live in a world where government money isn't actually what we use day to day or even what we sort of store our value in and that this new weird you know magic internet money is going to be what we use wasn't too far removed i'd heard that story before so for me it was like actually quite obvious welcome to the builders and bitcoin podcast a podcast about the people who bring bitcoin to life i'm your host rod and i go by the handle bitkite on twitter my guest this week is sam abasi ceo of proof of funds platform hoseki Sam is leveraging his experience in the traditional finance world to help Bitcoin hodlers demonstrate the value of their assets so they can participate in the existing financial system, such as securing a loan or even getting a visa without completely sacrificing the security and privacy of their Bitcoin. In this episode, we discuss and dig into how Hoseki makes proof of funds attestations possible, retrofitting Bitcoin onto legacy finance until we reach a Bitcoin standard, how Hoseki goes about hiring, and a whole lot more. I enjoyed this conversation immensely, and I hope you will too. So let's just jump right in. Sam, how the heck are you? Doing well. I don't, I don't know if you could be doing bad in Bitcoin Park. Oh, man. Thank you. Um, it's another beautiful day here in Nashville, Tennessee. And this is your first time in Nashville? First time, yeah. Sister city to Austin, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. No, absolutely. There, I, you know, as much as we joke, there's competition and so on. Like, what Parker and the team are doing at Bitcoin Commons, what Kyle and Carr and the team are doing at Pleb Lab. It is just so. Um, there's a friendly competition that pushes all of us up, but then there's so much synergy in terms of like uh, folks coming from Austin here, folks from Nashville going down there, um, and we're building in Bitcoin, which is just awesome. Yeah, it's a bunch of community builders. I'm really happy to have known all those people and become friends with them. Yeah, man. And you recently moved to Austin, yeah? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a little over a year ago now. Okay. Uh, how's that been? Amazing. I mean, I came for the Bitcoin and... Uh, <laughs> and you was, stayed for the... I stayed for uh, the food truck tacos, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, no, it's been amazing. I mean, it's lived up to all my expectations. Well, actually, no, it's surpassed them. That's um, awesome. The mind share is just, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, it just... It, it seems like so many people are moving to Austin, uh, moving to Nashville, moving to these other pockets um, and building, like you said, community uh, in their respective uh, cities. Um, and you you came from, maybe you can share your experience where you, you came from and then, because um, I think you were working at Fidelity mm. and you were in the Miami area and it's a very crypto area. So I'm curious to know like kind of your backstory yeah. Um, and how you went from, not, I wouldn't say 180, but like you went from that world into Bitcoiner, you know, hardcore, and now you're building what I believe to be a category creator in the Bitcoin space. Yeah. So, um, 2017 is when I professionally came into the space and, um, I say professionally, but just generally came into the space. Um, didn't really know anything about Bitcoin or just the, at the time, it was a crypto blockchain space. Oh, yeah. And I was a developer. I had a, I had a, had a company of developers. So we had certain skill sets. And um, that was conducive, you know, for a contract, for a contract-based company, it's conducive to, uh, it's just like the crypto space. Not, not a lot of Bitcoin projects. And through that, I, I learned about what the space is, about quote-unquote like programmable money. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Ethereum and those things were my gateway drug. I think I, fa I, think I found the light. Uh, it didn't take me too long. I, 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 um, like the story I tell is going to, going to building on Bitcoin in Lisbon and meeting mm -hmm. all these brilliant people. Um, the Blockstream team, uh, the bit refill team, um, a bunch of academics who are researching different Bitcoin topics. And, and I, and I realized then that, that these are the people that I want to be around because they're, re they're really serious about changing the world. The, uh, Ethereum crowd was, um, it was, it was a, it was a party atmosphere. You know, yep. it was like psychedelic infused, uh, you know, events, which again, are like fun and maybe have their own place, but I wanted to do something more meaningful and more, uh, fulfilling and, and Bitcoin definitely offered that. That's great. And then, so when you had this contract business, then you went to Fidelity, uh, I did, uh, no, I went to, uh, I went to Algorand after, um, that was still in Miami and 
I left Miami two months before COVID hit, um, which was, you know, kind of unfortunate timing. <laughs> I moved to Boston to work at Fidelity because I had decided that at that, that time I had worked on different crypto projects. Um, I understood that space really well. And um, it, it seemed like Bitcoin was the most obvious thing to spend your time on if you're mm -hmm. really serious and really long-term oriented. So at that point, I decided, okay, I, this is what I want to spend the rest of my life on, if possible. Um, and I had met some people who worked at Fidelity previously at one of the MIT Bitcoin conference, and they were just brilliant. And um, I just, I was like, well, if I, could, if I could possibly have the opportunity to work around these people and somehow absorb their knowledge, I'm going to jump on it. And so a job opened up at, at, at Fidelity in what's called FCAT, which is basically their like R&D department. Okay. So moved up there. Uh, fortunately, COVID hit, um, but regardless, I still worked there for a little over a year. And then, yeah, started Hoseki and, and moved to Austin. Yeah, that I think there's a lot to unpack in the mm. – oh, just started Hoseki and moved to Austin. Um, so I actually Googled the word Hoseki, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm now I'm, I know what the uh, name means, which is just awesome. But maybe you could explain the, the word Hoseki. And then I really want to know how the heck did you even think of Hoseki and then to be able to start this? Yeah, so I'll start with the name. Um, the name means jewelry in Japanese, and uh, may, maybe it's not the most literal sort of translation. I've heard gemstone and gem and other things. So if there are Japanese speakers, I hope you don't eviscerate me. I don't. I don't speak <laughs> Japanese. Wiz, you can come in to his DMs and, uh, or actually, probably replies. Just reprimand me. Um, so I, I named it that for two reasons, and it gets a bit long winded. So I'm refining this pitch a little bit as time goes on. So hopefully next time I'm here, it's, it's a little bit better. Um, but. There's two things. One, it's it's a it's it's a nod to Nick Zabo's shelling out. Mm -hmm. In it, he describes the wampum belts of the Narragansetts, which were jewelry. So you know, money's been different things over different time over 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 time, uh, in different places at different times. It was seashells, right? The reason for that is because uh, it, it's kind of got like nature's own proof of work sort of baked into it. It's very difficult to fabricate seashells, um, especially in in, in, in jurisdictions that it was used. It's impossible to fake, you know, the intricacy of a seashell. And when you find these things closer inland, it's just a testament to the economic activity of the area. Uh, but what they did was they would form these seashells into jewelry, which was called wampum belts. And they had an incredibly slow velocity of money. Uh, so it would exchange hands during life events, um, you know, birth of a new child, uh, unification of tribes, um, marriages. And, you know, I, I, I see Bitcoin's finality, that 10-minute that, that, that finality is incredibly fast, but also incredibly monumental. So for me, this is kind of like the modern-day rendition of, of what wampum belts were. Um, additionally, more, I guess, more, uh, more uh, maybe topical or recent is, um, you know, gold has been used as an inflation hedge for, you know, years. And gold jewelry especially has also been used as a form of investment. So in India, for example, gold back gold jewelry back lending specifically has been up like two hundred and fifty percent in the last year, <laughs> whereas regular lending is up like eight percent. And so it's sort of this contrived idea where Bitcoin is a lot of things to different people. And for me, I, I kind of think it might be some form of jewelry. Yeah. Whether whether you know metaphorical or literal or maybe a bit of both. Well, not to dox both of us, but um we grew up in an area where we had a revolution and we had to um uh, our families had to leave, um, not abruptly, but like they had to leave over time, um, for better, uh, opportunities. And, uh, our store of value was, uh, a couple things, one of which was jewelry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even though we're still, I would say a generation removed from that revolution, um, it's still super near and dear to me, um, uh, that you could have something that across different cultures, you know, uh, maybe some cultures like the Indian culture is like super, uh, valuable, but it can translate over different cultures as well. Um, so it could move over time and space. So, yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I, I credit my sort of understanding of Bitcoin entirely due to the fact that I, I, I am, I am Iranian and that my family had that experience and background. Um, you know, the, we, we live in a fiat world. And we live in a dollar-denominated fiat world more specifically. And uh, I was raised knowing that your environment could change in a matter of months. And it could change dramatically and quite violently. And more importantly, no one really expects it to change. And what it changes into is unrecognizable to what it was before. So this idea that 
maybe we live in a world where government money isn't actually what we use day to day or even what we sort of store our value in and that this new weird, you know, magic internet money is going to be what we use. Wasn't too far removed. I'd heard that story before. Um, so for me, it was like actually quite obvious. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy. We've only been in this experiment for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, oh, this is just the way life has been, you know, for an, our entire, well, it technically has been for our entire lives based on my age. But um, I think we all need to just study history a little bit more. Well, and I don't knock people for their apprehension either. It's like most people want to be comfortable. They don't want to sort of think about these catastrophic situations. I think it takes certain people who want to and, you know, maybe maybe troubled enough to sort of <laughs> go, go that go that route. Um, most people don't want to think about these things. So, yeah, but but again, I, I – when uh, I was I was asked recently, like, what's the best way to sort of um, pill someone on Bitcoin? And I said, well, <laughs> the best way to do it is to live in a hyperinflationary environment. Yeah. Uh, is to just be Lebanese <laughs> or yeah, yeah, be yeah. Zimbabwean because you genuinely do understand the need for non-government money because you've experienced – all the damage it can do. Yeah, totally. So um, now can you explain maybe Hoseki and how you started Hoseki? Yeah. So um, working at Fidelity, uh, there are two the, – the, the two public projects I worked on were um, – one was off of Bob McElrath's work. So Bob is brilliant. I had the opportunity to work with him um, a little bit. We just overlapped uh, just, just, just towards the end of his tenure. And um, that was uh, – we were working on Bitcoin Covenants. So – uh, the open source project that we released ultimately was called Vaulted Bitcoin Custody. The idea there was that you can um, you can sign transactions with two different spending paths and then delete the private key thereafter, locking those UTXOs into those two different conditions. A very primitive way to create covenants, and probably not you know the best um, the best and most recommended way to do so, but it was a functional way to make covenants, and so that was one of them. The other public project I worked on was uh, a paper that we wrote with. Um, KPMG, Deloitte, uh, Nick from Castle, uh, and a few other folks on proof of reserves. The objective there was to have an artifact that we could share with regulators and anyone else uh, once they decide to get um, educated on the topic. Ideally, we'd self-regulate, but the last thing we want is for regulators to impose their own draconian rules with zero understanding of what the asset can actually do. So it, it's a it's a pretty extensive paper. It was written with the uh, Digital Chamber of Commerce, but it starts with, I think, a history of proof of reserves a whole taxonomy on what these terms mean. And then my bit was the tech implementation. If an exchange wants to uh, actually conduct a proof of reserves, um, how would they do it? Uh, so coin floor is the, like, you know, marquee example at the time. Uh, and then we, you know, link to open source code as well. Um, so really just like a central repository that is comprehensive on proof of reserves. That's great. And so uh, you do this at Fidelity. You do this open source initiative. You probably see the problem still persists in terms of, um, the infrastructure, the piping that needs to be done. And then maybe you can explain like now how you start Hoseki. Yeah, sure, sure. So I wrote that. Um, well, I, I played my small part um, in helping write that. And for me, it was just one of those things where I saw something that I thought was undervalued. Um, you know, property rights are a very complicated thing uh, jurisdictionally and globally. Um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a book called The Mystery of Capital and the book describes why certain parts of the world are poor and why certain parts of the world are rich. The rich being the West, so, you know, North America, Europe, and, and uh, Japan, and the global South, third world, whatever you want to call it, uh, pretty much being everywhere else. And the author asks, is it because of market orientation? Is it because of IQ? Is it because of industriousness? Is it because of any of these things? Um, and the answer, of course, is no. And if you said yes, you're just you know, <laughs> nefarious. Um, the answer is no. It's 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 uh, it's none of those things. The, the 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 answer is a lack of legal frameworks around property rights. Yep. And what Bitcoin brilliantly does is it actually provides a legal framework without that monopoly on violence. And so building from that, I thought, well, okay, if it has property rights built in, then what is our mechanism for expressing that ownership? Mainly, it's you know signing and broadcasting a transaction, but um, there must be a cleaner way to do it. You know, we're on the cutting edge of tech. Um, there must be an easier way, and there is an easier way. So we just we just built an incredible you know UI and 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 service around something that Bitcoin natively offers, which is expression of ownership of Bitcoin, um, which again is what I love about this because it's not some complicated abstract thing yep. that's layered on you know several different technologies. We're just wrapping Bitcoin. Yeah, and uh, very fortunate. And thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, we you did a demo of Hoseki, and 
Um, by the way, you're an unbelievable storyteller. So like, I know you're like, you know, pretty hard on yourself and this and that. You did an awesome uh, explanation of a uh, signing a transaction and explaining it how it's like a check. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can just like re like state that story around how, you know, you explained signing a check and, and so on just for the audience. And then I, it's going to dovetail into a specific question that I have. Sure. Yeah. It, it's, it's really just a mental model. And I just came up with this out of desperation, trying to explain Bitcoin to some of the gray hairs um, at Fidelity. And I thought, well, what would be the easiest way for them to understand this? Um, and, and, and frankly, it actually helps a lot of us understand this too. Um, so I, 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 I just view a Bitcoin transaction as a two-step process. It's more than that, but fundamentally it's a two-step process. Uh, two, two really important key steps, which is signing the transaction and then broadcasting the transaction. And those two things are tantamount to signing a check and then taking that check to the bank. So um, a check is invalid unless it has a signature. Um, so if you try and take a check to the bank without a signature, uh, it's the, there's no way the bank can validate this and the funds aren't going to move. Uh, sim- similarly, if you have a signed check on your desk and never take it to the bank, then the check is valid. It has a signature. It would be processed otherwise. Um, but it, it, it isn't because you haven't taken it to the bank. And somebody could come and take that check. Right, right, exactly. Um, and so kind of extending this a little bit further, that's how I understand Lightning. That's, that's just my way of understanding Lightning, uh, where it's a bunch of signed checks being passed back and forth that never actually get taken to the bank, which in this case is just Bitcoin. Um, so our bit, Hoseki's bit, is the generation of those signatures, yeah. is, is using that alone without broadcasting a transaction, without moving funds, um, or selling your Bitcoin is is just verifying that you were able to generate that signature. And uh, maybe I'm going to just explain why I think uh, Hoseki is a category creator. And for someone like me, who some people will call me a toxic Bitcoin maximalist, and then some people maybe call uh, define me as a, a a Bitcoin minimalist. So to each their own. Um, I will say I'm, you know, my time capital reputation is all in on Bitcoin, building a couple businesses that operate on a Bitcoin standard. So I'm in and out of the traditional fiat system. Uh, With that said, um, I have Bitcoin accounts. I have a custodial accounts. I have uh, multi-sig accounts or collaborative custody accounts. I have um, other what we call self-custody or self-custodial accounts. Uh, I'm curious to like from your perspective first at a high level, your perspective on all three of those and the trade-offs associated to it, and then how Hoseki really brings those accounts together for individuals or businesses to be able to attest their uh, assets, if you will. Yeah. So a user can connect um, any source of funds uh, in which they hold Bitcoin. So it can be an exchange account. Um, and it can be self-custody accounts um, or it could be individual addresses. Um, multi-sig support, we also, we also have that. Um, so really, I mean, I think the biggest value prop is for people that want to self-custody their assets but don't want to actually give up the Bitcoin. Um, I'll take, just take a step back with sort of, again, part of the genesis of the company is that um, I was trying to get a mortgage, self-custodying my assets, and there just wasn't an easy way for me to prove that I own them to the counterparty. There wasn't an easy way for the counterparty to actually, uh, within, in this case, the broker, um, assess my assets. There were two options. One was my idea. The other one was the broker's idea. And the first one was, well, I mean, I could take a screenshot of the UI that I use. Um, it's like pretty much all I can do. And um, Google.com, let me uh, look up a big balance and then send yeah, it over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, just, or, just, or just edit it yourself, yeah. you know. Um, and... That it, it was frustrating that I even had to think about doing that because again we're on the I think we're on the cutting edge of technology we're, we're building this incredibly um, I mean, we got money without government and 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 that's just incredibly novel and incredibly innovative um, but I'm still relegated to taking screenshots that yep. didn't make any sense to me um, so that wasn't accepted but uh, the second option um, was to then send my funds to Coinbase and print out a statement which <laughs> was antithetical to the whole purpose of self-custodying in the first place. I didn't want, I don't want to give up my assets. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm very sensitive about my funds and I, and I, and I, 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 I'm kind of a control freak and I don't want to give up control. Uh, so yeah, I think the biggest value prop is for self-custody because the narrative sort of flipped. You, um, typically 
these counterparties, uh, if you ever have to prove assets, you normally have these assets held with the custodian. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just say your stocks, right? You just show a fidelity statement. Granted, even I mean, honestly, Fidelity actually doesn't even have ownership of those stocks. It's the DTCC. By the way, real quick tangent. I think we had this discussion in, uh, was it, uh, who was it talking about? But the movie Die Hard, OP, oh, I think, was talking mm. about this. That like the whole movie's premise was around those stock certificates yeah. <laughs> in the vault <laughs> that they needed to go and get, yeah. uh, which is just hilarious. But again, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, we've made you. leaps from the legacy system. And we just, I mean, like the world hasn't really caught up yet. And, yeah. and it's it's not anyone's fault. These things build in time and build in layers. So we're just a piece of what would normally happen anyway. Um so, so normally you have these funds with some trusted, you know, some reputable company with the, they're a big institution. They have a big brand name. Everyone knows who they are. And so there's that level of comfort. But the narrative's flipped now because you holding your own keys, you are an institution at this point. Like, you know, the, what, what's the mantra? You're, you're your own bank. Um, what I quickly realized was that I don't have any banking services as my own bank. And so for us, we just thought that, you know, we, 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 we're, we're building Hoseki with the assumption that Bitcoin's already dominant. And so what's going to be required to actually financialize this thing? And a layer for proof of ownership is kind of like a no-brainer. Um, that's why we see our, ourselves like this bottom stack. Totally. And uh, without giving up your custody, just to show that you – and by the way, uh, Bitcoin, I mean, I think over time will be the predominant asset. But it is also like just one input into an overall balance sheet, uh, if you will, or an overall financial picture for somebody to then make an informed decision to lend against that person. Right. And that's, and, and that's what we go into as well. We, we, like one thing that we stress is that, you know, don't have any contrived notion of what we're trying to attempt here. We're, we're not trying to simply have someone give you credit because you can, in, in this case with our, with, our, with our first product, which is called Statements, show a statement with a, with a Hoseki letterhead and your accounts, you know, clearly uh, delineated um, that you own some Bitcoin. The objective here is to have your Bitcoin play as a financial data point in addition to your other financial data points. Um, so you have some income, you may have stocks, you may have whatever other assets, but you also happen to hold some Bitcoin. You should be able to, you know, weaponize that. You should be able to use yep. that in some capacity. Absolutely. And so I guess this is a good segue uh, because there's obviously the, the custodial versus self-custody and then being, but more importantly, zeroing in on the self-custody side where someone like me would get a little bit nervous, not, you know, I, you're a, now become a, like a brother from another mother. So um, I love you. But you're also a company with uh, that's building and you're ho uh, connecting these different hardware wallets. And I think, was it right now? Trezor, Ledger, and Cold Card mm -hmm. are the three supported. Cool. And then you're pulling in an expo. Maybe explain that process of how you can sync into a uh, self-custody wallet, a hardware wallet, or a hardware signing device. Sure. Um, in the realm of privacy, so the platform, it's KYC, it's, 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 it's non-KYC by default. So all that's required to create a Hoseki account is an email address. To, to a degree, because like, but I, so I agree with you, but I guess it's up to the individual, right? Uh, what information they want to provide or need to provide. Yeah. And, and, and once they do provide it, it's voluntary disclosure. So let's just say you have all your accounts connected and synced up. That's and great. Again, for our first product, you want to generate a statement for it. You select which accounts you want on that statement. Uh, more importantly, um, the uh, like wallets and the individual addresses that you can connect uh, are are randomized account numbers on those statements. So it's not like your wallet, it's not like your XPUB is being leaked or like your address is being leaked because what we're trying to prevent is having, is like the current situation, which is doxing your wallet details to N. Mm -hmm. um, that's, what, that's what we're trying to avoid. So for users that are very privacy conscious, uh, we offer individual address attestation. So you provide a signature, for, uh, a signature for an individual address. You wouldn't have to give us your entire XPUB. Um, which is a bit of flexibility there because there are people that would prefer that that route versus just uploading their their wallet. So I think that is extremely massive, right? Because you can go down to the specific UTXO. You can self-disclose uh, exactly what you want in order to go get XYZ loan with this broker. And then the next broker, you can disclose, you know, whatever else you want to go get, whether it's a car loan, a mortgage, a uh, you know, a specific material thing that you needed to, to finance or whatever that may be. Um, I think like that's what your secret sauce is, um, making, empowering the individual to self-disclose exactly what they need to do in order to accomplish what they want to accomplish at the end of the day. And, and, this, and this comes from our own needs and our own perspectives in the world. I mean, 
the, the benefit of this company is that it's being built by Bitcoiners. So we have all of the apprehension that everyone else has. Um, there, are trade-offs, there, there are trade-offs that have to be made because of just limitations with technology just more broadly. Um, but we understand it is a sensitive thing you're doing. Um, you can delete your account anytime. You can, you can delete the accounts that you connect anytime. Um, we, when we say empower Bitcoiners, we, we, we mean that across the board, not, not just when you need to prove assets to a counterparty, but you know, empower you as a user on the platform as well. So I'm just curious now, like deleting information, like how does that work on your guys' backend database? Like, do you guys, once a delete happens, it's just... It's wiped. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned like uh, Bitcoiners, because I believe you are a through and through Bitcoiner. How do you guys, this is my personal selfish question, but like how do you, you as a CEO and founder, look at hiring like individuals, do you look for hiring specific Bitcoiners or do you look for these traits and then you want to help them educate them to become Bitcoiners? Yeah, it's, it's a mix. Um, first off, shout out to, I think it is a Swan product, Bitcoiner jobs. Yep. It yeah, is. Yeah. Um, they've done an amazing job of helping me recruit, frankly. Um, and I've had a lot of great talent come through there and they've joined the team. Um, it's, it's a, it's a mix. It's, it's tough because what I found is a lot of the time you'll find people that are Bitcoiners but they may not have all the skill sets that are required. They're just really passionate about Bitcoin. Um, so what we've done is we've taken some of those people and we've taken some people that are, you know, very skilled but may not have the cultural, you know, sort of um, accolades that we'd look for in Bitcoiners and we've blended them together. And again, we – your cultural values within the company sort of disseminate across everyone over time is what I found. Um, so we've been able to convert the non-Bitcoiners into Bitcoiners. I mean everyone is here – because they have a reason to work on this, you know, non-governmental money to begin with. So it isn't really, it hasn't been that much of a challenge for us. But yeah, we look across the board. I mean, you also don't want to silo yourself off into one type of person either. I think it becomes dangerous, especially at an early stage. Um, you want to have a, a sort of a, a diversity of just, um, not even thought necessarily, but just a, a, a diversity of, of just questioning things and being open um, to having those conversations. And, and that's been really helpful for us. That's awesome. Uh, and you guys are actively hiring right now still, or you guys are hunkering down? We're always hiring. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, we're not, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for smart people. Um, cool. we're, we're at a, we're at a good size with the team where we can pretty much, uh, build out everything we have on the roadmap. Well, if you look at me and Tom, we're pretty smart. Um, we're, we can clean dishes and, uh, <laughs> you know, back rubs and so on. So if you need that, uh, we're ready to go. Um, but in all seriousness, um, Where's the product today? Um, because as much as I, I truly believe this is a category uh, creator and uh, it helps me as an individual uh, because a very Iranian, uh, you know, we're in real estate and so on. So we need to do, show our proof of assets uh, quite a bit in order to get loans and then, you know, participate in the fiat um, monetary system. Um, and then on the business side, you know, like um, where we're, you know, collecting sats and such um, that we may need to... Um, do stuff in the regular fiat system. Like, where is the product today, uh, right now, to be able to use? And then where do you see it? And let's say you come back in three months, because I, by the way, before you answer that, um, you're one of the, like, I joke with, like, Harry and a couple other ones. You guys are big brains, and I, I love talking to you guys. And I want to do this as a series with you, Sam, uh, and then keep coming back to this because when you're creating this category, there's so much to talk about and there's so many stories to tell that I think uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about in the future. But where is the Hoseki product right now? And then where do you think it's going to be in the next, let's say, three to six months? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't call myself a big brain. Um, I'll call you a big brain. How about that? Sure. <laughs> you are uh, a big brain. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we honestly see Hoseki as like a very sort of dumb solution um, because I, I think it's like an obvious thing that needs to be built. I, I, I just um, – I think, I think vision might be more important in that sense. But the product today – so we're launching our – I don't know when this will be released. But uh, next week we'll be releasing our first product, which is called Statements, which is what I described. Um, because the need now and, – and to be very honest, I was a bit apprehensive about just launching that because we have you know a line item of other products that are – like basically done. We're just kind of doing some user testing and bug fixing um, because I wanted to be more feature complete. I didn't want to just kind of like build a product where you can maybe export a PDF. Um, but this has been so useful for our alpha users. We've had, uh, you know, like tons of alpha users in, the, in, in these past four months. And 
the feedback has been, this is an amazing service. Uh, you know, can't believe this exists. This, this, this has helped. Um, and the use cases are, you know, we can list off the use cases. But um, but so because it's useful for our alpha users, I have to make the assumption that it's going to be useful for other people as well. So we'll just release this because it is functional um, and needed. And so you can connect your exchange accounts. You can connect your um, hardware devices. And you can provide a signature for an individual address. Uh, and then um, print out a statement with your name, uh, your address, and then your accounts listed. Um, there's two types of statements. You can have what's called a level one report, which doesn't have your name or address. It's like for your own, for your own personal uses. And then the level two report uh, would have your name and address because um, that's how the legacy system identifies you as a person, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I talked a bit about that infrastructure inversion thing. We're trying to retrofit Bitcoin into what the legacy yeah, system like, needs. Um, and so... Uh, we really just had to make something that looks official. Um, if they're taking screenshots and if they're taking statements from, uh, well, if some of them are taking screenshots, uh, and if they're taking statements from different exchanges that all look different, that have different, you know, um, that are, that are, that are missing some fields sometimes, then what we probably just have to give them is something that looks official, which is a Hoseki letterhead statement that has your name and address and has everything listed off as a regular bank statement. I mean, the thing it's modeled off of our bank statements. Um, and we have, we've had incredible success with it. Um, but it is that, that concept of like retrofitting something incredibly innovative into, uh, into something that like, you know, uh, maybe doesn't work as seamlessly. Yeah. You gave the example at the meetup, um, uh, when we, or we had the innovation of cars mm -hmm. on, uh, mud roads. I don't know if you want to maybe explain that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and this is Andreas's point, um, it's probably a really old video at this point. Uh, but so the concept is called infrastructure inversion. I don't know if he came up with it or if it's a, if it's a concept just, you know, more broadly. Um, the idea is that whenever there's a new technology, it needs to ride on the rails of the old technology. And then there's a flip. And having the new technology ride on the rails of the old technology is incredibly rough. However, having the old tech ride on the new tech is trivial. So the first example are, horses and cars. When cars were first developed, there wasn't any infrastructure for cars. Um, roads weren't paved. Uh, there were no traffic lights. Uh, the thing with, you know, uh, unpaved roads are that horses have limbs. They can easily sort of go in and out of potholes uh, and otherwise, but cars can't do that. And back in the early days, they weren't very functional either, so they couldn't do that. Um, additionally, there are no gas stations. There's no traffic lights. Uh, we talked about the red flag laws where, and I might be butchering this a bit, but it's you had to have, uh, if you wanted to operate a car, you had to have an engineer with you in the car. Uh, you'd have to, uh, I think there was also one other expert that had to be in the car. And then you ha you, you'd have to have two different people with red flags, both in front and behind the car, <laughs> letting everyone know that a car is coming. Um, so it was, very, it was a very hostile environment for cars. And however, uh, once the infrastructure for the new technology, once, once the infrastructure for cars was developed, having horses ride on paved roads was trivial. Very, very easy. Um, the other example is uh, telecommunications and the internet. So having um, dial-up, right, trying to somehow squeeze the internet into telecommunications lines, uh, telecommunication lines was incredibly, um, you know, inefficient. It was rough. It didn't really work very well. Uh, however, having, uh, having telecommunications on the internet, it's trivial. It's incredibly trivial. Um, same thing with banking and Bitcoin. Having uh, Bitcoin ride on the, on the banking rails is incredibly difficult. But having the banking rails ride on Bitcoin is seamless. You can you can uh, you can make a Bitcoin transaction take three to five days if you want to. Um, you can you can replicate the inefficiencies quite easily. Um, so that's that's just kind of culturally what we brought to Hoseki. We recognize that look, we are we're we're dealing with some real innovative stuff, um, but we're going to have to sort of retrofit it into the old world for now, uh, and then and then we'll experience a flip. I love it. And you alluded to use cases, um, and you talked about. Uh, a number of use cases in uh, or at the meetup. And this is why I do think this is a category creator. Um, so we mentioned the mortgage use case. Maybe you could uh, shed some light on some of the other ways some of your alpha users are using Hoseki. Yeah, so mortgages was our go-to-market. That's where we've had the most success. Um, and it's nice because the incentives are aligned there. The broker wants you to get approved. That's how they get paid. So they're always trying to figure out how to actually get you through the door. And so when they see an official looking statement, that makes them a lot more comfortable. Now, you know, once we make this more programmatic, then they'll have even more reason to approve you because they'll have real-time updates on your, on your account information, whatever you want to selectively disclose to them. Uh, 
Uh, but so mortgages has been the hallmark sort of use case. The other thing that came out of Blue, um, and, and, and I think this is a common sort of um, common theme when you're building tech is just things you hadn't accounted for, didn't even really consider. Uh, for me, that was um, visa applications, residency and visa applications, which I think is so beautiful because this is a jurisdictionless asset and people are trying to use it to be global citizens. But it's the same problem. If you're self-custing these assets and some government needs to, you know, assess that you actually do have these funds because you're going to come and, and live there, you just don't have an easy way to do it. And again, they're looking for something that makes them comfortable. Um, so those are the two main ones. But we've had people use it for exit visas, um, for car loans, for personal loans between friends as well. Um, but I would say mortgages and visa applications have been the two main ones. So with anything that's being a category creator, I feel like there's going to be a lot of follow-on or copycats that, that, that come about. How do you guys continue to differentiate uh, yourselves? And then I do want to ask the question of like, how do you guys make money? Um, or how do you think about making money um, uh, go forward? Yeah, of course. Um, partnerships are kind of the thing I usually go to. Um, we're first to market with this. So brand recognition, I think, is going to be really important. This is building a trusted sort of brand name. And I think if you're able to do that well enough, early enough, then that itself is a big differentiator. Um, but I think partnerships are key. I think setting up partnerships the way we have um, really sets you apart. We're, of course, incredibly competitive. So, you know, being being cutthroat also helps. Um, but I think with other Bitcoin companies, really, it's a matter of understanding the asset, understanding who you're building for and why you're building and, and not making key mistakes early on. So I think those things will differentiate us um, mainly. And for making money, it's uh, now it's sort of a subscription-based model for users. Uh, now it'll be free for the first couple of months, probably until the end of the quarter. We're going to keep it free because um, we're sure there's going to be other bugs that we just haven't seen yet. And, uh, you know, I'd rather not have a customer support nightmare and sort of just um, sort of bring in more users now than later. And But we'll turn on a subscription-based model for our retail users. But uh, the, other, the other way are institutional relationships between borrowers and lenders. Um, and third-party integrations where proof, uh, proof and assessment of Bitcoin ownership is needed, I think is going to be another big area that we, can, that we can really differentiate ourselves and also bring in some good revenue. Yeah, and I, I look at it like there's a great retail play and there's a lot going to be like retail demand. But if you nail the infrastructure partnership play and get the piping going, man, the world is your oyster, right? Because... Okay, I have, let's say, a river account and this account and whatever account, you know. Now I'm going to go pull up. I hate pulling all these statements, you know, all disjointed or my self custody. Like, yeah, let's take a treasure sh uh, screenshot and, you know, pass it along as well for like a big time loan. Um, it's just not the experience that I want. And of course, those are listening. Yes, there are trade offs. Like, I'm, I'm self. Uh, disclosing what I need to disclose in order to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Um, and I am also trusting Hoseki with this information. So these are all things that are known with me, and I'll make the decision there. Um, but going back to the infrastructure side and the partnership side, uh, I am curious to, because uh, there's so many lenders, and like I, I kind of look at this as like a plaid kind of play, if you will. Like you kind of log in, you're able to incorporate and, and get all these different um, accounts together and then be able to, uh, again, product one is just the statement, right, if you will, to go and get the loan. But am I thinking about it correctly? Yeah, you are. That's that's spot on. I mean, yeah, the statements play is really just like, it's. All, I, I see it as like a temporary solution now. We're going to have it live for, you know, the foreseeable future. Um, but I think that's just a way to actually communicate to the world what we're trying to do. Uh, this is clearly more infrastructure. That's, I think, the more sustainable route. Um, and that's what we intended from the beginning is, you know, we, we, we called it Bitcoin infrastructure. I was a bit worried in the beginning when I called it that because I thought, well, you know, is that is that more of just like marketing buzz? Are we actually building infrastructure? But now I realize, no, this is true financial plumbing. Um, the, this, a, a programmable layer in order to do this seamlessly um, and, 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 and privately is, 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 is true infrastructure. Um, I think financial applications are just one application. I think there's yeah. several different industries and different verticals that this can go into. Um, so yeah, we're obviously incredibly bullish and really excited about what, what'll, what'll happen, uh, once, once all this is live. So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot because now I'm curious, which is, you know, if you fast forward 10 years or five years from now and 
um, like in a perfect world, like, you know, 8 billion people have voluntary access to Bitcoin and Bitcoin is like, let's say the, uh, a, a monetary network that is grown into exponentially grown. What does Hoseki look like and how are people interfacing with Hoseki, uh, in that world, in a Bitcoin standard world? I think most people won't even know they're using us, which is, which, which is my objective. Um, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be critical infrastructure that's being used kind of everywhere. Um, and the end user doesn't even know they're using us at that point. That's pretty gnarly because I think in a way there's like products like, I don't know, what, what's like a common product that you would think about today just to so that people can f- like f- anchor that, that, that thought you just described? I think, I think Plaid's a good one, but, you know, given I think the fact that we do know Plaid's name may not be the best sort of totally. analogy. Or but. Stripe. For example, Stripe is another one. Yeah, I mean, any of these, any of these infrastructure financial services companies, they're we're we're, we're building that model, but on Bitcoin. Um, so I'd, I'd I'd point to any of those really. I think I think Plaid might be the most appropriate, but yeah, Stripe Stripe as well. Do you think those companies survive or have to uh, like truly adopt a Bitcoin focused or Bitcoin first uh, standard? Depends on the timeline. Um, I think they. I mean, I think they're going to have to eventually. Um, I think Stripe is already looking at or already has baked in crypto payments. I'm not entirely sure, but um, I think they're going to have to. I mean, as the asset grows, as it becomes more relevant for day-to-day lives, as more people adopt this, it's they're they're going to have to adapt. I mean, they 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 can die, sure, sure. But uh, I think I think the ones that actually have the forward thinking and the and the and the and the fortitude are are just going to have to adapt. Yeah, I, I, this may be somewhat controversial, but I do think. We're going to live in all these different layered worlds and uh, whether it's still the fiat um, or stablecoin world where you need to use those uh, to transact or there's other like layer two cryptos to play whatever video games for some reason why they're using those tokens to whatever other digital assets, if you will. Um, Are they going to be a store of value? Are they going to be a future global medium of exchange? No, in my humble opinion. Um, but there's going to be some relevance. I mean, heck, we still use direct mail today, mm. right? With the advent of email, um, there's a number of things. Yeah, I, I don't think these things are going to die off. And that's why I said it depends on the time frame. Um, if you're looking like 50 years out, maybe. But in the next 10 years, like I think, you know, zombie tech is a thing. I I think these, I think people will still be using fiat currency in some capacity. Um, we're just going to build this other parallel world. And it's going to cater to a different demographic altogether, people with different needs. Um, and maybe it exists alongside one another for a bit and one becomes more powerful than the other. I think we know which one. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think a lot of this will remain. It, it, it just – it'll be a little bit neutered. Yeah. So I think that's a great uh, point to like actually close our, our, our first conversation, which I hope is going to be many. Because I do think there's going to be that flip, like you you alluded to with the uh, the horse and the car and um, uh, a couple other examples. Um, do you want to maybe uh, share some closing thoughts as well as a place where people can find you, Sam? Yeah, sure. Um, so Hoseki.app, www.hoseki.app is um, the website. Um, currently, we still have our wait list up, but next week you'll be able to actually uh, create an account and go through oh, the whole awesome. flow. Um, otherwise it's at Hoseki app on Twitter. And then I'm at Sam Abasi to two B's and two S's on, on Twitter. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. Seriously for spending the last three, four days with us here in Nashville. Uh, thanks for hosting apps, dude. Uh, for me and Matt, like, you know, me casa, su casa. So anytime you're in town, you need an hour, a day, 10 days, a hundred days, you got a spot. Um, that's for sure. Um, and, it's truly inspiring. Again, like you are the epitome of this podcast, which is the Builders in Bitcoin, which is the podcast about people who bring Bitcoin to life. And um, just speaking from experience and how difficult it's been to just educate and explain Bitcoin to the existing financial services world. I know this is going to sound stupid. And a lot of you folks that don't interact with the existing financial services world will be like, really? Well, all they want right now is a stupid asset statement that's on a nice letterhead that shows like numbers and says, okay, yeah, that, that works for me. Last two months statement, 
cool, let's go improve this loan. Because the incentives are aligned. The mortgage broker actually wants to give you that loan. They just need to go through their, their process, if you will, and just uh, check some boxes. Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what is uh, uh, the potential out there. Because I do think if I was an like underwriter um, financing people who believe in sound money, there's, there's probably a stronger uh, discipline associated associ with those folks and a stronger need to actually pay the, the loan back because they don't really care so much for debt. Um, so I'd be underwriting them left and right. Well, and that's why we say Bitcoin is your creditworthiness. Um, you holding Bitcoin, you're sort of just by virtue of the fact that you're holding Bitcoin and have been holding Bitcoin, you're proving that you are a, you know, a, a sound investor, someone who is low time preference, someone who isn't um, uh, an impulsive spender. Uh, you actually think about money in a different way that the current fiat system thinks about money. And yeah, I, I think those people are, I think those people deserve credit uh, or maybe more credit than uh, than otherwise. And of course, I'm going to ask you another question now because uh, we're just going to keep going, which is uh, credit worthiness. That's really interesting. I think the FICO score is so stupid uh, that they take it from three central organizations and then somebody can ruin my credit score by you know posting that I didn't pay or whatever, um, which then I have to go and physically go and make, like do a lot of uh, things. And it's just... For the underserved or unbanked folks, uh, it's killer. Mm. Do you think either Hoseki or just in general, there would be like a Bitcoin credit score? I think there might be something along those lines. I mean, you know, we've we've thought about this. We've run thought experiments. Uh, maybe if you self-custody your assets, you're, um, you got a different sort of rating, a different interest rate than if you have it on an exchange. Or if you have it with a multi sig custody company, maybe you get a different sort of profile. Um, yeah, I think the way you hold your assets is a lot about you. And I think lenders would be interested to see sort of how you do that. Um, and they may, um, they may give you different offerings because of that. So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to relate it too closely to credit systems today because they do suck. Um, but I do think there will be something along those lines within, within the Bitcoin world. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you again, Sam. This has been an absolute pleasure and, uh, I'm already looking forward to number two. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Sam as much as I did. Building financial infrastructure that enables Bitcoiners to prove ownership of their assets and better interact with the financial world today is a true game changer and I believe can be a category creator. I love spending a few days with Sam in Nashville and already cannot wait until the next time we get together. So if you're enjoying the pod and want to automatically stay up to date, please like and subscribe in your favorite podcasting app and make sure auto download is on. This would also mean the world to me. Lastly, come visit us in Nashville at Bitcoin Park. The Bitcoin community here continues to grow. We hinted at a number of events, pop-ups, workshops, and meetups, and even launched Nashbit Devs here at the park. And there's a whole lot more to come in 2023. So if you want to be the first to know, join our meetup page at bitcoinpark.co. That's bitcoinpark.co. And check the show notes for this episode for a link to the Bitcoin Park Discord community server so that you can stay connected with us. Until next time.